Hello and welcome to The Blueprint, Canada's conservative podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Schmale, Member of Parliament for Halliburton, Fourth of Lakes, Brock, broadcasting live this week from our nation's capital in Ottawa and my parliamentary office in the Valor Building. Thank you once again for joining us. We have a great show lined up for you today. But as always, I need to remind you, because it's very important, you need to like, comment, subscribe, and share our content. Help us push back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. So on today's program, we have Garnet Genis. He's the Member of Parliament for uh, Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, in the beautiful province of Alberta. In the second half, we actually have another Alberta for you. Uh, Kelly McCauley, he's the Member of Parliament for Edmonton West. He'll be joining us to talk about the Parliamentary Budget Officer and some of the issues the government is having with securing protective equipment for our frontline healthcare workers. So let's kick it off with Garnet Genis. Garnet, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jamie. It's great to be here. Uh, got an all Alberta show today. An all Alberta show with an Ontario host. There you go. Uh, I see you're in Ottawa as well. I guess yeah. uh, fake parliament is is happening this week. So you will be, uh, I'm sure, up asking questions at some point. I'm I'm up for duty next week, uh, but I've I've been around in Ottawa for most of this. I've, I've got a young family and rather than schlepping them back and forth on the plane uh, in light of of uh, concerns about spreading COVID. It just made sense for us to stay put where we are and be doing the constituency work remotely. That's true. That's the uh, the brilliance of technology now. You can do it from almost anywhere. So you're on the show here today to talk about Canada-China relations. You're on the special committee set up to look into that. And of course, you're not really doing much of anything right now. <laughs> not, not you personally. Anything at all. Not no. you personally. <laughs> let's let's no, point so, that out. So, so Jamie, uh, this is really important because with, with COVID-19, I think there is a renewed uh, awareness of the challenges in the Canada-China relationship and in uh, the Chinese government's relationship with really all sorts of countries around the world. The reason we have this pandemic is because of the politics of uh, the Chinese government system. And I'm not saying they they wanted this to happen or they uh, you know caused it to happen intentionally, uh, but there was a, an intentional suppression of information in the early days and weeks uh, that is is really just endemic to to a, an authoritarian uh, communist system. Uh, and we live in now in such an interconnected world where that suppression of information has deadly consequences. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, waking up a lot of people, Canadians and, and others around the world, uh, to, to the way in which the politics of China uh, can impact our own well-being and our own security, as well as our own economy. We have uh, Canadians detained in China, this sort of hostage diplomacy that's, uh, that's ongoing. Uh, yes, there's the issues of the pandemic. There's the issue of uh, Chinese government influence in the World Health Organization. Uh, there's issues of Huawei, our security. Uh, and various organizations sounding the alarm about uh, foreign interference uh, here in Canada, Chinese government efforts to shape our debates, uh, to influence university campuses. There's so many issues uh, that really do impact our own economy, our own security. I know the, the, the Conservative team at the Industry Committee has been a, doing a great job around a study uh, dealing with the possible impacts of state-owned enterprises from China uh, that are using the economic challenges we're, we're facing to potentially uh, buy up a whole bunch of assets and, and strengthen their strategic control and influence. We really need to be on top of these issues. And the Liberal government is uh, very naive when it comes to China. And in fact, uh, more than naive, they've been ignoring uh, advice that they've been getting on this these issues. So uh, we've had many responses. We've been very active in the in the opposition uh, Conservative Party. Uh, we're we're certainly emphasizing the importance of uh, of cooperation among like minded countries, like minded democracies, in order to resist uh, this kind of uh, aggression and interference. Uh, I, I've joined as a co chair a new organization called uh, the in Interparliamentary Association on China that's trying to coordinate the response of democratic countries to these issues. Uh, here in Canada, our, our focus has been trying to get the Canada China Relations Committee up and running again so that we can look into all these issues. Uh, I haven't even mentioned Hong Kong so that we can look into all these, these, uh, these problems. Uh, that are that are coming out of the politics of the Chinese government. Uh, but the Liberals have uh, opposed and blocked our efforts to get that committee up and running because they do not want uh, this scrutiny. They know they're offside with the public when it comes to their approach to China, and they don't want the committee up and running. 
Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. So let's start with the fact that we're in the COVID-19 pandemic. Let's talk about the WHO. Let's talk about the amount of false information coming out of communist China going to the WHO and then being uh, passed along to health agencies right across the world, giving them kind of basing their information on their decisions that we find out after the fact is in many cases false. Absolutely. Uh, and the Liberal government has said, uh, Minister Karina Gould in particular, has said, well, we can't really hold the World Health Organization responsible for that because uh, they just, uh, they're they just responsible for sharing the data they receive. Uh, I mean, that, that's, that's ridiculous. They're responsible for the quality of the advice they give. And there are other UN organizations uh, who take seriously their responsibility for monitoring the actions of member states. Uh, we have uh, we have agents of the UN that are responsible, for instance, for uh, disarmament and preventing nuclear proliferation, whose job it is uh, to verify uh, what what kind of data they're they're getting out of uh, various uh, member countries. Uh, we wouldn't have a very effective international system if if the system was sort of completely value neutral and in, 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 and truth neutral in its uh, willingness to repeat whatever kind of garbage in, garbage out information it uh, it, it receives. So we expect better uh, from the World Health Organization and from the Liberals. Um, there are, it seems, particular issues with the World Health Organization that go beyond even what we see from, from many other uh, uh, multilateral or UN-affiliated bodies in terms of being uh, beholden to the Chinese government. Uh, I mean, one area where this is so obvious is on, you know, the, the Chinese government's involved in uh, organ harvesting and trafficking, uh, and we've tried to, to, to confront that issue in Parliament. Uh, the World Health Organization has actually praised China's organ transplant system. They're, they're, uh, they're killing political prisoners, to taking their organs, uh, and uh, the World Health Organization has, has uh, instead of confronting that, uh, has said uh, that China's system is, is transparent and it's fine. So uh, we, we've, got, we've got some big problems there that we need to address, and we need a government that is serious and hard-headed about this. Um, with, with the liberals, we, we don't have that seriousness. We have a lot of naivete, even even sympathy for the kind of dictatorship model that exists in China. Uh, and, and that has big consequences for Canadians in terms of our economic and our, our, uh, our other forms of security. So why do you think the, the, the WHO is so connected to China, afraid to criticize them at a, in a lot of cases? Uh, well... We, Even we look see, at the information. They they didn't they they didn't verify it. They they just trusted everything was a hundred percent, and then told every other country how to operate during the pandemic. Yeah. Well, we see efforts by the Chinese government to influence multilateral bodies and and redefine international doctrines to their advantage. WHO, the Human Rights Council. We see various various cases of uh, of them trying to do that, trying to play the multilateral system to their advantage. Uh, why in particular the World Health Organization? Well, I, I think uh, it's critically important that we have a investigation into this situation, into what happened at the WHO, uh, that that investigation be fully independent, uh, but also able to access all WHO documents and able to conduct interviews inside of China. Uh, I've asked uh, Christia Freeland very specifically questions about this, uh, the need for a proper investigation after the fact to hold the WHO accountable. Um, WHO doesn't want to be accountable, though, and, and uh, our, our colleague Matt Jenner and other conservatives on the health committee have tried to uh, force WHO officials to come and explain themselves before the health committee. Pretty normal thing that you have multilateral uh, organizations that receive money from Canadian taxpayers uh, be expected to give account of themselves before uh, parliamentary committees, but that hasn't happened. So we need to get to the bottom. Of it. And uh, and unfortunately, what we see is the government of China, the WHO, and the Liberals uh, are doing everything they can to prevent uh, proper, effective accountability that would actually uh, that would actually keep us safe. Okay, let's start. We talked about the parliamentary committee. We talked about uh, the issues there. Let's talk about Huawei. They they yeah. had a significant interest in our infrastructure, especially our five G network. Where is Canada at now? And this well, is something we as conservatives have pushed back against for ages. There was no way to Huawei was yeah. was the line for for the longest time. Absolutely, and and uh, big big news on that front recently was the British government essentially uh, uh, coming coming to an awareness uh, of the problems and uh, 
up till then, the government had tried to kind of figure out how to be kind of uh, half in, half out with Huawei. And uh, much to their credit, there were there were a lot of individual members of parliament from the Conservative Party that were uh, were flagging that, that this just this was just wasn't going to work. And now uh, the British government is uh, is is now uh, taking a leading role, saying that uh, let's find alternatives. Uh, let's uh, let's work together as democratic countries uh, to to develop the infrastructure we need. Uh, and I think this is a trend, fortunately, we're going to see more of, which is democracy saying, you know, we, we're not in a great position to take on the government of China alone. But if we stand together, if we build a, a kind of principled multilateralism uh, based on a principled alliances of like-minded countries, and Canada needs to be part of that partnership on Huawei, but we're still, you know, the only the only one, the only outlier really among among uh, this set of, of like-minded countries uh, that is still trying to stand in the middle of the fence. And uh, that's that's really disappointing. You know, we Canada, you know, at, at best, Canada is at this point going to be the last one on board. And uh, that's, that's not where we used to be under Stephen Harper. Uh, the situation in Ukraine, for example, the Russian invasion, uh, Canada worked multilaterally, but it was leading. It was leading the response. Uh, and now we are, uh, you know, if we're if we're along at all, we're uh, we're kind of following along. Uh, Jamie, I, I just make a contrast in terms of you know people hear this buzzword multilateralism a lot when you're working. You know, I see the the liberals have a kind of uh, promiscuous multilateralism. They want to just go with go with whatever organization they want to be in whatever room they want to be with, with whatever other group of countries. Uh, our approach is a principled multilateralism, which is working uh, in a, in a thoughtful way with like minded countries. Uh, in order to uh, advance our values and our interests, that doesn't mean we uh, we just want to go along to get along. No, it means we work with those uh, who share our values in order to be as effective as possible. And let's just let's remind uh, those watching and listening: uh, our Canadian intelligence agencies has raised concerns many times about allowing Huawei access to our communications infrastructure. Uh, I think that's important to remind. Our, our viewers and listeners. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there there have been all sorts of red flags raised by experts about all kinds of different aspects of uh, of this relationship. Uh, the Huawei dimension of it, certainly. Uh, I was uh, substituting in at the industry committee yesterday for some great testimony about uh, the real risks to our security and uh, and to our economy from the actions of Chinese government state-owned enterprises. Uh, the the experts, whether it's external experts, intelligence experts, or or our own public service, uh, have been uh, have been raising these flags with the government. And this is why, you know, Jamie, up until now, I've been saying the liberal government is naive when it comes to China, uh, and and I think that's that's true to some extent. But but it's hard to give them the excuse of being naive when they've actually been given advice by experts uh, that that. You actually need to watch out for these things. I mean, it's one thing to say somebody's naive because uh, they didn't they didn't bother to check into the risks and they just assumed it was going to be okay. But if they were told about the risks, right? Uh, you you really have to wonder what's what's going on. This kind of uh, uh, ideological desire to have a uh, you know as warm as possible a relationship with uh, with this extreme and dangerous regime. Um, you know, it's it's not business as usual. It can't be business as usual with the government of China. Uh, right now, we have the the uh, huge, significant aggression in uh, in Hong Kong, uh, where they're ignoring the Sino-British Joint Declaration and effectively, uh, in violation of human rights and international law, trying to to put Hong Kong directly under the rule of Beijing through a national security uh, law. But at the same time, we see. Uh, aggressive border incursions into India over uh, disputed territory of the, the China-India border. Uh, we have uh, escalation of, uh, of Communist part, Party activity, Chinese Communist Party activity around the world. Um, you know, all of these things, th these, these aggressive steps are happening at once. Uh, we have to wake up to this and be aware of this. Um, you know, we, we, are, we are in a, the best position to protect ourselves uh, if we don't put our heads in the sand and pretend that these things aren't happening, uh, so my message to the liberal government would be to get their get their heads out of the sand. And uh, uh, you know, I think Canadians want to see 
a, a serious, thoughtful, and principled response to these threats, uh, and, and one that, that, that actually works with our like-minded international partners. Well, there's a couple of things you said there that I, I want to touch on. Uh, first is the relationship we have with China and why it's so important to remember that they aren't our friend in a lot of cases. Take, for example, what they did to our Canadian, Canadian agriculture and the way they just put an immediate stop to the imports on a number of products, which, which caused our farmers problems just because they were trying to prove a political point. Well, it, it's very clear that the government of China um, is, is uh, coldly out to pursue what it sees as its own uh, self-interest. And that means, uh, first and foremost, I think the preservation of the regime. Um, I, I would say that I think uh, Canada is a, a friend to uh, the Chinese people, a friend to, uh, to China in that sense. Uh, I, um, I, I, I always think it's, it's important to make this distinction because, uh, you know, the primary victims of uh, the, what the government of China is doing uh, are, are the Chinese people, are people who are uh, really feeling the tightening screws of the Xi Jinping regime. Uh, things, things, weren't, uh, things weren't great before, but uh, the, the tightening of the screws in terms of freedoms, in terms of uh, ability to, to speak, to, to practice faith, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing uh, really a, a worsening situation. And uh, what, what you see in Hong Kong is the response of people who are able to respond to some extent, uh, who, who are saying, no, we, we desire freedom, democracy, human rights, exactly. the rule of law. Um, we saw this in, in Tiananmen Square. We just uh, remember the 31 year anniversary of the terrible massacre in uh, at Tiananmen Square. Uh, where Chinese people uh, expressed their desire for freedom and were gunned down as a result. And it's an important distinction to make because sometimes you hear people on the political left, even like our ambassador, Dominic Barton, appointed by, by Justin Trudeau as our ambassador to China, uh, essentially using the, the cultural argument to justify uh, the authoritarian system, saying, uh, that that this is uh, this is a more Confucian culture where they value collectivism over individual uh, well-being. Well, uh, you know, I think he misunderstands Confucius, and I think he he misunderstands the reality of of China. Uh, that 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 every time people are given a choice, uh, they choose freedom. They choose Always. human rights. And Absolutely. they're um, you know, when when people don't have freedom, it's because they're they're being forced into something else at the point of a gun. Uh, so, so as conservatives, uh, we are, and and Canadians uh, all should be uh, friends to China. But that means standing up to the threat posed by the Chinese Communist Party. And let's talk about what the, I was going to talk about this with Kelly McCauley, but unfortunately, he's having connection problems. So uh, I'll I'll throw this question at you, uh, Garnet. The the shipment of PPE, personal protection equipment for our frontline healthcare workers. We've seen pictures of planes coming back empty or near empty. And when equipment does hit the uh, streets, it's often defective and it's being sent back. That's despite the fact that we sent, I believe it was 16 tons of our medical equipment over to China to help them combat COVID-19. But yet we are supposed to, again, as we've talked about, have this good partnership with them uh, obviously, it's it's quite lopsided right now, and we are, we are getting less than adequate supplies back to us. Yeah, well, we have a situation where the government here is is uh, not thinking strategically about protecting our national interests, and that's very clear when it comes to PPE. Uh, they're they're thinking instead about uh, buying friends in order to get us onto the UN Security Council, uh, and uh, and if they succeed, it will have been at, at, at an incredible cost to our to our national interests. Um, yeah, you're you're on point. I mean, they were they're sending vital personal protective equipment. Uh, right at the beginning of this crisis, uh, when we were already going to be short here in Canada. And then, you know, with great fanfare, the Minister of Foreign Affairs is tweeting about how the government of China is sending masks here. Uh, well, there's massive problems with the, the quality of the equipment they're sending back, and a lot of it hasn't been usable. And it's not just Canada that's been experiencing this. The, mm -hmm. the government Many of China other countries. has been, been trying this... Uh, they call it mask diplomacy, right? That where they they're trying uh, desperately to blunt the sort of public relations disaster that COVID nineteen has been for them by by sending 
masks around the world and couldn't even be bothered to ensure that the masks were were of a of a usable quality. So, um, I, I mean, this this really underlines a, a big problem. You know, I mean, a, a a problem on the part of uh, the government of China, why they're they're trying to look like they're buying goodwill by sending defective products, uh, but a big problem on our side that that you know where where's the government? You know the gov- the government's a- applauding the, uh, the 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 Chinese government sending over equipment and then has uh, nary a word to say uh, except when under questions uh, about the fact that that there are big quality problems uh, with that. Uh, well, so, so, well, here's an even bigger point, Garnet, too. Remember when Taiwan sent Canada all this medical equipment that was of good quality? How long did it take for any minister on the liberal side to say, thank you, Taiwan? They, they wouldn't use that those two words in the same sentence. Yeah, well, they had to be really pushed by, I think it was Ed Fast uh, from our caucus who was pushing them on that point. Uh, we... Uh, we, we, we have uh, not seen a willingness from this government to learn from or engage with Taiwan in the midst of this. Uh, when Taiwan's response to COVID-19 has been, I think, probably among, if not the best in the world. Uh, Taiwan Agreed. was at, at likely at greatest risk uh, because of the potential exposure to, uh, to China. Uh, notwithstanding the, the political tensions, there's still a lot of uh, people-to-people interaction that happens between Taiwan and the mainland. And uh, you know there would have been there would have been a huge risk, and yet Taiwan managed that very very well. Uh, and uh, and 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 I you know ironically they're not part of the World Health Organization, right? Because of WHO right. politics getting in the way, um, and Canada needs to be more vocal about that as well. But uh, but it just shows you know who you, COVID nineteen it kind of it kind of pull, pulls the mask back, uh, no pun intended, to show uh, who's who's uh, really prepared for events like this and who isn't, right? Uh, the government of China actively suppressing information. The World Health Organization, uh, you know, kind of uh, all over the map and sharing sharing bad data from, from uh, China. Our government here in Canada was not prepared. Uh, and uh, Taiwan, outside the WHO, was very effective. Other countries that... Uh, are members of the WHO, but pursued their own course. Uh, Czech Republic, New Zealand, South Korea, are some other examples of countries that did very, very well in their response. And it wasn't about kind of where on the political spectrum they were necessarily, but it was about their willingness to uh, to take it, the, the, the pandemic seriously, but also uh, really look into the evidence themselves instead of being reliant on the WHO uh, or, uh, or, or uh, you know, they, they also put action ahead of, of image, right? Uh, this yes. has been a problem here too. Is uh, uh, you know the inconsistencies from the government. It's it's all about image. You know, one day we're saying uh, uh, got you got a distance, and then another day the prime minister is showing up at a at a big uh, public event. Um, you know, we we need to make these decisions based on on a, a careful evaluation of the science, not based on image. Well, you you saw that with the social credit points in China, where you 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 have good interactions, you say the right thing, and you get credit points that uh, that up your score and allow you to do certain things. And and uh, we're not even we can probably touch quickly. You only have a couple minutes left. Uh, quickly, we have uh, work camps. We have almost uh, re-education camps. Maybe you can quickly touch on that in, in China as well, that that uh, many in the media aren't even covering. Uh, absolutely. Well, so so uh, I'll just give the sort of the, the the Coles notes on what I think is critically important for your your listeners to understand about the Chinese system, right? Uh, like number one, if you've read George Orwell's 1984, uh, this is the most serious attempt in human history to take George Orwell's 1984 and make it a manual for how you organize and govern society. Um, yeah. It's it's uh, you know it's it's. It, it's very much there. And the way in which new technology is enabling a greater and greater repression. So, uh, yes, everybody being tracked, everybody being surveyed, people being assigned points based on uh, what they do or don't do, say and don't say. And uh, in particular, uh, the, the government is is always kind of running experiments to try and, and toughen and increase the kind of technical sophistication of their system. Uh, and we see the particular brutality of that in uh in in the Uyghur areas in uh, uh, eastern China, uh, where the sorry western China, um, where where the government is um, 
putting uh, Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, just absolutely brutal, the treatment. Um, and, and there's all this sort of technological surveillance that's, that's tied into it. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the tools and techniques, the, the kind of infiltration of institutions, uh, the, the kind of all encompassing controlling scoring, um, this reflects the fact that Xi Jinping is trying to build an alternative political model. Uh, the, the Chinese system is not evolving into a democracy. Uh, it's trying to become something completely different. Uh, and what we face in the 21st century is a critical contest between these two systems, between uh, what we have, some of the freest societies that have ever existed in human history, and uh, inside China, the most technologically sophisticated authoritarian society that has ever existed in human history. Um, this is this is the choice. This is the challenge. Uh, and, uh, you know, as sobering as it is to say, it's not inevitable that we will prevail. Right. We have to we have to take uh, our our values, our principles and the need to defend them very seriously because our success in the face of these threats is not inevitable uh, and it will only be achieved uh, if if we as a people are willing to take seriously what's at stake and take the steps we need to take. Uh, so on on simple things like uh, like banning Huawei, right? Uh, these are these are our security issues uh, that will have a defining impact on our ability uh, to preserve our free societies uh, up against uh, the threat of an alternative social model uh, and um, and I don't want to have to tell my grandkids that we didn't do enough uh, to prevent the spread of this kind of uh, authoritarianism around the world. I want to be able to say that um, just as our grandparents uh, contended with authoritarian uh, ideologies successfully and they gave us systems of freedom and liberty, uh, I, I want to be able to say that we did the same for subsequent generations as well. I agree with you. Thank you very much, Garnet. We have to leave it there, unfortunately. We got a bit of extra time because Kelly McCauley had connection problems. So I do appreciate you expanding on a lot of those issues. Well, uh, my, my, my pleasure, but I hope your listeners get to hear from Kelly. I know he's doing, at some point, I know he's doing great work and uh, his his uh, detailed engagement on the public accounts issue is, is so important for Canadians knowing that they're, uh, where their money's actually being spent. So thank you for the opportunity, uh, Jamie, and thank you to your listeners as well. We'll try to get Kelly on next week. So uh, hopefully, yes, he has some really good things to talk about, and hopefully we will be able to get him on. So uh, thank you very much, Garnet Janice, Garnet Janice, sorry, Member of Parliament for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, in the beautiful province of Alberta. Thank you again for joining us. Remember, we need your help in pushing back against the ever-moving liberal agenda. Please like, subscribe, comment, share to our content. Also, if you aren't able to watch us, you can listen to us on certain platforms like Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, CastBox, those such platforms. And that way we're able to expand our coverage even more. So thank you very much again for joining us. We'll be back next Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time with another episode of The Blueprint. And of course, remember, low taxes, less government, more freedom. That's The Blueprint. Thanks for joining us.